just ask the Lord to speak to us now. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity to open your word this morning. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would open our eyes to see you more clearly and to walk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm really excited about diving into the book of Ezekiel this morning with you. The beginning of a series of messages that take time to, to see and to experience and to try to understand and live into the incredible visions that God gives to the prophet Ezekiel. And we're going to begin in Ezekiel chapter 1, which I'm calling a vision of God's glory in this series, Clear Vision for Uncertain Times. Chapter 1 of Ezekiel ends with these words. Like the bow in a cloud on a rainy day, such was the appearance of the splendor, the chabad, or glory of God all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. When I saw it, I fell on my face and I heard the voice of someone speaking. Ezekiel, far from home, has a vision of God that causes him to fall on his face in awe and amazement. He was living in an extraordinary time, a time when his entire world was literally turned upside down, something that I think we can relate to. He could no longer see the road ahead, and then God gives him this extraordinary vision. God helps him to see everything around him differently, with new eyes. And I pray that the same would happen for you and for me as we, as we look at our own lives and our own world through Ezekiel's eyes. But before we look at Ezekiel's first vision, a vision of the glory of God, let's try to understand a little bit more about Ezekiel, the witness of God's glory, Ezekiel and his times. In the 30th year, we read, beginning in verse 1, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by the river Kabar, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, it was the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to the priest Ezekiel, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar, and the hand of the Lord was on him there. Now, Ezekiel was born to a family of priests in the land of Judah. It was the year 622 BC. It happened to be the very same year that the book of the law was rediscovered in the temple and brought to King Josiah. Do you remember that sermon I preached a while back in Chronicles? It was very near the end of that series. And it was a time of great spiritual revival when the people began to return to the Lord and away from greed and injustice and false worship. Ezekiel's name means strengthened by God. And surely this was the prayer of his parents, that God would strengthen their son and empower him to be a true follower of the Lord and a faithful priest in the pattern of Josiah's leadership. As it turns out, Ezekiel was going to need every ounce of that supernatural strength. Because after the death of Josiah, his son Jehoiakim takes the throne and he undoes all of the reforms of his father. When Ezekiel is 17, he learns that Jehoiakim actually burns the scroll of Jeremiah the prophet right in front of him. When Jehoiakim is accused by Jeremiah of greed and arrogance and injustice. Meanwhile, Ezekiel had already begun a 10-year training program as a priest. Before he could even graduate from school though, the world as he knew it stopped. It changed forever. It sounds pretty familiar, don't you think? But it was the year 598 BC. Ignoring the, warning, the warnings of Jeremiah, King Jehoiakim defies the power of Babylon that now held sway over Judah and the Middle East. And as a result, Jehoiakim is killed and then his successor, Jehoiakim with an N, is made king. 
And Jehoiakim, with an N, immediately surrenders Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar, that is the king of Babylon, and the city is spared from destruction this time around. But with Nebuchadnezzar now in control of the city, 10,000 of its leaders and its builders and artisans, and this is something that we know from the, the ancient writings of Babylon itself, are taken captive to the, the city, the, the capital of the Babylonian Empire. And Ezekiel at this, at this age of 25 is among those who take that long journey, a 700 mile walk to the heart of a foreign land. You can imagine that as he began that long walk, this young graduate student must have looked back to see for one last time the temple and, and the city of Jerusalem that he so loved. Will he ever see it again? We read in verse 1 that it was in the 30th year, that is Ezekiel's 30th uh, birthday, if scholars are correct, and five years after Ezekiel arrived in Babylon, that the heavens are, are opened. And surely this was at a moment when Ezekiel was discouraged and searching for God as he marked his third decade, quarantined in a foreign land. Ezekiel saw visions of God that enabled him to see not only his, his birthday, but the past, the present, and the future now in a whole new way through God's eyes. And it was when God proved to Ezekiel the truth of his own name that he truly was strengthened by God because he was going to need God's strength just to see what he was about to see. Let's look now at the wonder of God's glory that is revealed to Ezekiel. What we call commonly the chariot throne vision in verses 4 to 28 of chapter 1. Let's read verse 4. As I looked, a stormy wind came out of the north, a great cloud with brightness around it and fire flashing forth continually. And in the middle of the fire, something like gleaming amber. In the middle of it was something like four living creatures. This was their appearance. They were of human form. Each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. As for the appearance of their faces, the four had the face of a human being, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle, that is on the back side. The living creatures darted to and fro like a flash of lightning. Wow! <laughs> Notice that Ezekiel's vision of God begins with an approaching storm in verse 4. And then in verse 28, at the end of the chapter, it ends with this glorious rainbow. And both of these are power, powerful symbols of God's presence in the Bible. You know, there's a scene, if any of you remember it from the 70s, from the classic Steven Spielberg film, Close Encounters of a Third Kind, where we see these speeding balls of light uh, emerging from a storm cloud, almost as though they had read chapter one of Ezekiel for inspiration. Of course, in Spielberg's film, these are uh, alien ships coming to check out the earth and, and to make first contact with the human race. And I love that look on the character Jillian's face, that mother uh, holding her baby, that look of awe. Isn't that awe what we were made for? That awe and wonder, not just at alien creatures uh, or strange visions, but awe at the wonder of the Creator Himself. Because within that storm cloud, Ezekiel sees a vision of God with three distinct features. First of all, Ezekiel sees something like four living creatures. Because we see these four living creatures again in the book of Revelation, I want to focus on their appearance here. Each one, Ezekiel says, was winged uh, and they were of human form, but with four faces. The face of a human being, the face of a lion, the face of an ox, and the face of an eagle. They seem to be configured in a square with their backs to one another. And a creature like that, as we're reading it, may seem like the stuff of fantasy movies and sci-fi today. But in Ezekiel's context, exiled in Babylon, it would be actually much more familiar. 
Statues of winged creatures like this with human bodies and various animal faces guarded temples and palaces in Babylon, and they could be found in paintings holding up the sky. But, but why? Well, it's because they represented the highest forms of life among the different realms of creation. The human face comes first, and it faces forward. Then we read about the lion and the ox, which face to either side, and the eagle, which seems to be facing in the opposite direction. And they signify respectively what is wisest, that is the human face, noblest, the lion, strongest, the ox, and swiftest, that is the eagle in creation. Animals still represent strength and speed and nobility today. Think about the mascots of colleges and professional sports teams. Think about the Philadelphia Eagles or the Detroit Lions or the Chicago Bulls or even Oxford, which is named for the Ford where oxen cross. And, and great sculptures have tried to capture the wisdom and the beauty of humankind for centuries. These are ancient symbols of the power and the glory of creation that endure to this day. So what Ezekiel describes is really not as strange as at first we may think. And under each of these four winged creatures, Ezekiel sees something else in verses 15 to 21. Something like a wheel within a wheel. Let's continue to read. As I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures one for each of the four of them. And for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of beryl, and the four had the same form, their construction being something like a wheel within a wheel. When they moved, they moved in any of the four directions without veering as they moved. Their rims were tall and awesome, for the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. And when the living creatures moved, the wheels moved beside them. And when the living creatures rose from the earth, the wheels rose. Wherever that spirit would go, they went, and the wheels rose along with them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels." Wow, this is such a fantastic vision. The wheels within wheels. You know, wheels are one of the most fantastic inventions of humankind. It first appears about 4500 BC in ancient Mesopotamia. And let's face it, it stood the test of time. They worked pretty well for the simple horse-drawn wagon. And they still work for today's 300 mile per hour racing cars with a few modifications. Airplanes find them pretty helpful too. In Ezekiel's vision, the wheels suggest limitless speed and movement and freedom. God goes where God wants to go, whether fast or slow. God is the power behind all the powers in heaven and on earth. And he's the reason for our reasoning and our most brilliant inventions and discoveries and for all the wonders of creation itself. And so what is above the living creatures and its wheels within wheels is no surprise because the whole thing, the living creatures and these fantastic wheels are supporting something like a throne. Let's, at, let's look at verse 22 and following. There was something like a throne in appearance like sapphire and seated above the likeness of a throne was something that seemed like a human form, gleaming amber and something that looked like fire enclosed all around. Like the bow in a cloud on a rainy day, such was the appearance of the splendor all around. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Do you notice how careful Ezekiel qualifies his every description of this vision? He doesn't say that he saw four living creatures. He says he saw something like four living creatures. He doesn't say he saw wheels within wheels. He says, I saw something like wheels within wheels. He doesn't say he saw a throne with a human form upon it. He says, I saw something like a throne and something that seemed like a human form. Why do you think he makes all these disclaimers? It seems that Ezekiel is really trying to describe the indescribable. He's trying to put into words what, what words alone really can't fully describe. I think Ezekiel is too full of amazement to be overconfident. And so he's careful about what he claims for his words as he tries to describe this amazing picture of God's glory. 
You know, there's this popular notion that the Bible portrays God as an old man with a long white beard. You know, there's not a word about what God looks like in the Bible. And here in Ezekiel's vision, we cannot even make out God's face. But the message is still crystal clear. God is on the throne, and that's good news. In Ezekiel's day, it was Nebuchadnezzar who sat on the earthly throne. In Jesus' day, it was Caesar Augustus who sat on the throne. Today, our world is filled with prime ministers and presidents and, and parties and parliaments and, and dictators of every kind. But in every age, it is God alone who is sovereign over all of history and who the Bible says is a God of justice and mercy and steadfast love. And as Jesus followers, we go on to share this incredible good news that Yeshua is actually the image of the invisible God, that the one who cannot be seen is made visible in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that the God of Ezekiel really did descend from the heavens and came and moved in among us. Now that we've tried to unpack the first of Ezekiel's stunning visions, I want to return to the question of where it all happened. Because the answer to that question is so important for you and for me today. Let's look at the where of God's glory back in verses 1 to 3 again. A later scribe probably added the words of verse 3 where we read, The word of the Lord came to the priest Ezekiel, son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kabar, and the hand of the Lord was on him there. Notice that word there. And that word there is so important. It's there for a reason. Because it was there that God showed up. Not five years ago in the temple where Ezekiel had been finishing graduate studies for the priesthood. Not as he once walked freely through the streets of Jerusalem. Not while he was praying by the, the Jordan River where Israelites first entered the land of promise. Not in any place that Ezekiel had come to think of as holy or as holy land, but by the river Kabar in the heart of a foreign land, in a settlement, a work camp no less, among the exiles so far from home. And yet it was there that God showed up. It was there where God seemed to be absent and his people rejected. It was there where Ezekiel himself, on his 30th birthday, may have begun to wonder himself if God really had abandoned his people. And so it was there that God came to him. It was there that God called him. No border guards could keep him out. No imperial powers could restrict God's entrance. Ezekiel wants us to know that God was there. And he wanted all of his people to know, which means God can meet us here as well that God is at work here, here, wherever we are, calling us to follow him. Now I want to ask you this question, how will this knowledge impact our choices and our commitments and our most disheartening moments this year? Ezekiel, for one, says this in verse 28, When I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard the voice of someone speaking. In other words, Ezekiel got down on his knees to worship. And so I want to say this. Would you join me on your knees? Or would you raise your hands with me right now in praise, knowing that God is with you and with me, that God cares for us, that God loves us right here? Would you respond in praise? Because worship is the first step toward a life of true purpose and joy. Take a moment right now right there where you are to ponder Ezekiel's vision and this truth and to listen for God's voice as God is calling you.